this is William Del Pilar, your conservative Latino, and I'm here with Big John, your big extra large host. Your girthy host. But I got to say, Big John, every time I say Big John and you respond, or rather when, when you respond that you're Big John, I'm thinking Big John stud. And I've said that before, yeah. but I don't know why. Every single time, you know, you're gonna be at your. I'll be at your funeral one day. <laughs> you want to say a few words? You know, Big John stood. <laughs> well, you know, I used to work with the guy, so that that fits. Yeah, I, I can picture your wife hollering out, "Yes, he was." <laughs> <laughs> a little kudos to the dead man. Yeah, well, yeah. As she leaves with another guy on the arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Of course. Uh, I always tell my wife, just make sure he can pay the rent on his own. <laughs> <laughs> so, Big John. Yes. Major League Baseball is actually having a contest that just ended. It was yeah. uh, the other day was the final day for the entry. I saw it as I was rummaging through all the news notes, and I just thought it would be a fun segment. Let's talk baseball. Plus, sure. Pete Rose is in the news again <clears throat> as the man being born in the wrong era, and I kind of agree to an extent. And then we're going to talk a little bit about TNT. But first of all, real quick, what's your favorite baseball movie off the cuff? Um, I probably have to say Major League. Tom Berenger uh, and Charlie Sheen. Yeah, yeah. Mainly because, um, first of all, uh, I'm partial to comedies. I think we've talked about this before. In general, I just like comedy. So if you could get a good baseball movie that involves uh, comedic premises, I'm all in. And I think Major League was probably the best one like that. You know, I think baseball movies are the one movie that has to have the classic Hollywood formula. You have mm. to leave that movie having felt something because that's what baseball is all about. Tugging at our heartstrings about America, the pastime, the relationship yeah. with fathers. It, it's just that good all-American feel. And whether you agree with it or not, it's one of those things I think you can't help. It's like the national anthem. People may be complaining about it but those same right. people complaining they'll be singing along it's just something ingrained in us well i definitely agree with you perhaps when we were kids uh we could talk about it but i don't know if that's the case anymore i mean baseball was definitely interwoven into the american societal fabric there's no doubt yeah. um it was the preeminent sport and it was a uniquely american sport uh for a long time so but I can yeah, answer that. I don't know if it still is or not, but yeah, I agree with you though. Yeah. I mean, I, I believe we're the last generation. We're the last generation who could come in on a Saturday morning and the world series was on as a kid on yeah. a Saturday. Yeah. Cause I was a huge big red machine fan. And I could tell you every player, uh, I think actually what happened with baseball is obviously the rise of, uh, of the NFL with the direct sure. TV package, the yeah. marketing, the physicality, the brutalness, the violence. And, and we're no different than the fans during the Roman uh, era. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. Uh, so fast sports entertain us. And I just, I just actually, uh, what do they call it on getter? I gettered, <laughs> or maybe well, I had the response to somebody and said that. You're absolutely so, right. I mean, baseball is not a TV friendly sport. Sport. I mean, it's easy to film, but it's not made for to take advantage of TV, whereas football is um, baseball is meant to be attended in person, I think like football games are nice. But honestly, I haven't been to a live NFL game in years because it's more enjoyable for my couch in, in front of my big TV. Right. That's the um, blackout rule. Um, yeah, for, uh, that if it's not sold out. Right. Which mm -hmm. almost never happens anymore. Well, they, they kind of they kind of uh, 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 they cheat now. Yeah. Somebody, an advertiser, usually swoops in and buys the last fifteen. 20, yeah, because they'll make more money anyway. But um, exactly. But the other thing also is that baseball is really was even today. I think is meant to be seen live. Like, if you go to a baseball game now and you get to sit in the stands and have a beer, enjoy the nice weather, make a day of it. And Correct. it's usually a great bonding experience between um, parents and children. I, I was going to say father and son, but who knows in this age, how, you know, if it's mother and daughter as well. But well, but the problem with that, Big John, now is, and it's one reason baseball has tried to address this shorter yeah. in the game, because I'll be honest, by the time you get to the seventh inning stretch, and this is true about baseball, this is why I believe baseball is a slowly dying sport. And when I say slowly dying, I'm talking about Big John and I will be dead and maybe our kids will still be right. alive and it'll be around. But right. I think it, 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 within the next hundred years, it, because it's slowness, it's going to die. But by the seventh inning stretch, I had not been to a baseball game the last 15, 20 years where I'm not looking at the watch. I can't tell you the last time I was actually 
at a great baseball game because that's what the playoffs are for. They're few and far between. And for me right. and, and millions of others, it's usually a great pitcher's duel. Some people like to see the home runs with Sosa and uh, who is it? And McGuire were battling right, it out, right. et cetera. We'll get out into all of this. But should Pete Rose be allowed back into baseball considering how Major League Baseball is the gambling as to what a lady of the evening is to a sailor? You know, Pete Rose is a poster child for everything wrong right. with gambling. And yet we just had the first, maybe the first professional player, but the first major league baseball player endorse a sports book. You yeah. know, finally, we update you with our newest podcast to come, TNT. And no, we're not talking Tom and Jerry. <laughs> yeah. So let's get right into it. So off the top of my mind, there's two movies that come to 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 me in terms of favor, and that is The Natural and uh, uh, Eight Men Out. Now, The Natural isn't one that comes to mind when I think of baseball movies. I, I don't know why, but Eight Men Out that it just always to me. I saw it as a kid and uh, we've talked about the big picture. Yeah. So when I saw that movie, I was looking at it, even as a kid from the big picture, how each move. But I think why I'll never forget that movie is because it's the first time I learned about it's not bigger government, it's not politics, but the powers that be that can come down to destroy somebody who's innocent. Sure. And that's when I discovered who Shoeless Joe Jackson Shoeless was. Shoeless Joe Jackson. You yeah. know, guilty by association. Right, exactly. You know? yeah. and, uh, and I think I've never forgotten that. And I think that to me, this, all, everything out of that movie, that's what I, I left the way with. And maybe that helped uh, create an impression of me of society and the little guy. It, it, it did. And I mean, look, there's certainly been controversy. I mean, most historians now will will probably agree that Shoeless Joe Jackson had really nothing to do with throwing uh, the 1919 World Series. The black for the audience, his num that is based off his numbers. Right. He, yeah. he had a great series. Right. He didn't do anything uh, that would be indicative of throwing the series. Um, you might make an argument that he's guilty simply because he didn't rat out his teammates. You know, like there's a lot of that. Like uh, when they arrest mob figures, even if you weren't the guy pulling the trigger, people assume you're guilty and perhaps rightly so because you knew about it and you should have yeah. reported. You, even though everybody says don't rat, don't think. The truth is, if you witness a crime, you should be reporting it. Um, so to the extent that Shoeless Joe Jackson knew about it, but didn't report his teammates, He's guilty in that sense, but guilty of actually throwing the series? No, um, I don't but, think anybody believes. But you know, that. John, at the end of the day, just, uh, they may have hammered him too, because you know, good and well, somebody in that system was like, just keep your mouth shut. Nobody oh, absolutely, yeah, keep yeah, your yeah, mouth yeah, shut. yeah. And you know, so I'm anyway. just saying, I'm saying there's a possibility of that, but yeah. In terms of movies, um, I don't know. Do you want to go down the, the list and just- Yes, yes, we're going to talk about that. So yeah. for, for the audience, you know, baseball is technically older than the movies. In fact, in, in, in researching for this topic, and I say that a lot, and the reason I say that a lot is that maybe a little pride, but we want to bring you a show uh, that, where, where you may leave having learned something. Right. And I ran across, a note, it's called, if you go to YouTube, it's called Early Baseball Film by Thomas Edison. 1898 and the in the comments game. it was called the ball game oh, that is that what the, title was? Of the ball game yeah, yeah. so well yeah, it's, it's just it's just like 15 or 20 seconds it just shows a guy yeah. hitting and running the first base and what's what's ironic is below you can see the people describing who it is what they went on to do etc cetera, etc cetera. i am not a fan of edison as a human being he was a scumbag scumbag vile evil uh, he would kill to get what he wanted not necessarily humans but animals and i'm uh, thinking about electricity here but uh he was a scumbag but he was innovative he was an entrepreneur and he, he was a genius it, it's one it's one of those great contradictions in life he was a right. genius and he certainly improved life for a lot of society but exactly. like you said he was an asshole human being like like a lot of people will say the same thing about steve jobs, steve jobs. yeah right? jobs. So, i knew you were so, going there yeah, yeah. So, so like, it's just one of those contradictions you have to live with, right? I mean, and, right, he was a genius, right. but he was an asshole. So you you kind of put it together, but exactly. But yeah, but, you're right. He was testing out his new filming equipment, and exactly. and he decided. And I think the game was Rutgers versus somebody in Jersey. So yeah, it was in Jersey. So it was, it was Rutgers. Jersey something is well, one yeah, of the guys. I forget. But but for the audience, go yeah. out there. It's grainy, but it's history. It's history. And, right. and the other thing I learned is that. Uh, 
the first baseball movies were actually uh, had baseball stars. Technically, the first movie stars of Hollywood were probably already established baseball stars through some of those early right. movies and uh, it mentions uh, in my research that came out to a few names and the, the, the what I got out of it is how fleeting fame is these were big names back then and when I say big names big names because we were not a fragmented society so most people got all their news entertainment sports etc through just a couple of channels you know so a hat tip to Will Leitch 25 of the best baseball movies ever John what was the first baseball movie uh right off the bat that's right it was, that i guess right technically there could be some argument but that's what's considered the the yeah. the first uh baseball movie the political tie is it came out the same year as the democrat party's uh fan favorite film <laughs> the birth of a nation yeah <laughs> by Woodrow Wilson. yeah yeah, yeah. But, it was it was it was um look it, you're right i mean birth of a nation is what it is it was a clan film basically Mm -hmm. um but you have to personally like, screen and beloved by woodrow wilson okay yeah it uh, was he had a showing at the white house for it i believe you i believe you but see i don't know exactly all of that but here's the thing you have to take into account that at the time watching movies was like watching magic you know like I, so so there's the technical experience of watching something like birth of a nation or right off the bat um because, like, can you imagine if, like, if all of a sudden you could go into your living room and turn on a 3D hologram like they have in Star Trek, where everything you could touch the images and you could interact with the images as if it was an alternate reality, right? Oh, I mean, no, no, John, you're right. The truth of the matter is, Birth of a Nation is as well known for the message it was, the vile message it was, uh, the Democrat Party was sending, uh, but it's also revered because it was one of the greatest technological breakthrough yes absolutely. that's all that i'm time. saying it's a di yeah. much oh, like no no, no. that's is that an oxy would you call that an oxymoron no oxymoron it's not an oxymoron it's i would think a dichotomy is a better explanation it's it's two natures for the same thing right yeah yeah they're yeah, not necessarily yeah. opposites which is what uh oxymoronic means it means it's opposite like when you say jumbo shrimp yeah and those two that, aren't really opposite those are societal uh, right, norms exactly. there yeah yeah but, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's that's why and you know what though it's one of the few things where i've seen no pushback from anybody but that's probably because the film's so old people don't even understand what the film's about when people talk about it all yeah. right so the reason we're doing a baseball show is mlb was having a baseball contest big john and i filled out our brackets there were uh one two three four 16, 16 movies. Right, right, right. Out, out of those 16 movies, John, one, two, three, four, five, six of them I have never seen or oh, really? I saw them and just don't remember them. Okay. But like the Sand Law. I'm like, I think I saw that like on HBO or something because that's a little older from the night. Uh, ironically, it was on HBO this past weekend. So oh, there you it, go. just by dumb luck, I had just seen it yeah. again. Uh, right so before this the, let's up. talk about each one as we go down we'll just have some fun with this and and hopefully help the audience bring back some nice great memories as kids or, or even as moments with their family yeah. so what's Field the first dreams, matchup what's the Field first matchup? dreams versus angels in the outfield yeah that'd be to me the field of dreams <clears throat> It's not overrated, but it's arguably probably the best known uh, 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 baseball movie. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's true, but I will say, uh, compared to Angel, Angels in the Outfield was basically like a movie made for seven year olds, which which is fine. But considering it as an adult, I don't know, because it just doesn't play well. You know, it's like these mystical things. So, yeah, I voted for Field of Dreams in that matchup myself. Yeah, I mean, that was a no brainer, wasn't it? At yeah. the end of the day, it's uh, a situation of the obvious. Uh, uh, what was the next film? What was the next battle there, John? The next battle was uh, The Natural versus For Love of the Game. I mean, that, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. Uh, the, the, oh, you the, already the, said you think The Natural was your favorite movie. Right. And, and uh, what makes The Natural magical for me as a kid, even to this day as an adult, some of my most famous books and movies that I read are the ones that play off the, the history, meaning they'll go back in time to an actual historical event with real characters. And people don't realize the natural was based off of an actual person, uh, obviously slightly based based off the story. A dramatization. 
Yes, 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 yes. And it was based off of a player who actually got stabbed by a woman, right. a serial killer trying to take out uh, uh, the stars of, uh, of the sports. And uh, Robert Redford did a good job. It was a sappy movie. Yes. It, I will call it uh, the male guy's chick flick, where you can take the girl to and you'll both enjoy it. Yeah, the, it, it's, it definitely is a movie that's based on sentimentality. And it's also a movie that you could take your girlfriend, wife, or whatever to. Uh, and and they probably wouldn't object to it being a baseball movie. Do you know what I mean? Right. So yeah, in that matchup too, I I took the natural as well. And for love of the game, I don't even remember that movie to be quite honest. And ironically, it had Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner had a nice little run in the in the nineties uh, with some long, boring movies. But I think <laughs> for love of the game, he actually was nominated for a Raspberry. Oh really? For being I did one, not know that. For being one of the worst actors that year. Um, I, I could be wrong. It. I could be wrong, but that's the way I remember it. But yeah, the love of the game really doesn't hold up to the natural. So, so people, if you haven't seen the natural, which I'm assuming a lot of you haven't, because it came out, I want to say right about the nineties, sometimes it's, it's very iconic in film lore uh, because of this one scene that Robert Redford hit. And I'm not giving anything away. It was in the previews. Beautifully shot. The ball. Beautifully and I want to say it was in Chicago and Wrigley. Yeah. And, knocking out all the uh lights well, out and the hitting way the a music... home hitting a home it was a beautifully look i think the movie is sappy to be honest with you it's not one of my favorites but um that cinematic thing of him um in the bottom of the ninth uh hitting the home run to win the game right after he started bleeding from the old wound he suffered as a young player from this uh attack uh the ball rising majestically knocking out the lights and then as he's rounding the bases in slow motion you have the the, the sparkles and the exactly the, the sparkles the, is what kind of did and the too. lights you know so from from a cinematic point of view beautifully shot scene but the movie overall is it's it's very average for me it's very sad. right no 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 and, and, and i can see that but what also sold that movie was the uh what do they call it the costume the era. Oh, it was yeah. The the it was it was very authentic looking. The old very, the old very. wool uh old uh, wool uniforms. It looked very authentic. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those movies where it all comes together. It's like there's no one. You can't point the one 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 something out of the movie and go that's what did it. It was truly a whole ensemble piece. Uh, yeah, and I'm not talking actors, but from the set production to the to the directing. Well, the all the actors as well, right? Because who was in it? It was uh, uh, Robert Redford, Glenn Close, right? Uh, uh, you know what? That's a good question. I, I don't think it, know. I think, I think Glenn Close was his love interest. Um, and and then the guy who was, uh, I forget his name, Prosky, the manager. But anyway, uh, it, so I think that was a better shot movie visually than it was story-wise, which for me is always a 50-50, but that's okay. Um, you know, I, I was reading a couple of articles and uh, the uh, uh, author critics were, uh, at least in this panel, they all loved it uh, like I did. And I was shocked at how they all, most of them thought Field of Dreams is overrated. All right. So here's two movies, John. I can't remember uh, if I saw The Sandlot versus The Perfect Game. And I vaguely remember The Perfect Game. Uh, and, and I guess technically speaking, politically speaking, I should uh, know that one inside and out as a Latino, because it's about a group of Mexican kids, a perfect game, who are the first non-US team to win the Little League World right. Series. Right. And honestly, I stopped watching movies that want to make a political point. Maybe, I, I don't know when this came out. If it came out the last 10 years, then I, then I purposely didn't watch it uh, because I, I'm like, I, I'm not yeah. 12. I don't need to be indoctrinated. It, again, I don't know if it was making a political point or if it's just the story of the first non-US team to win the Little League. So, I mean, right. you know, I mean, I don't know. I would, again, I would, I, I tend not to read as much political influence in, in those types of movies, but I picked The Sandlot. I think The Sandlot, and again, now you're talking about movies that should appeal to people who are like in their teens, right? And, and for the record, The Sandlot is pretty much baseball is centering around these kids' misadventures. Right. It was a summer where uh, it's, it's, it's almost like the Wonder Years, where there's a guy recalling his youth and what moving to a new town, the only friends he ever made were on the Sandlot. And right. his best friend came from the Sandlot. And then it's this experience. Think of it like The Goonies or Lean on Me. Exactly. But it just has like a baseball theme to it. It centers around the Sandlot. So I picked the Sandlot in that one. I, uh, you know what? When I did the bracket, I found that spot uh, 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 blank. 
<laughs> you know, on the flip side, the uh, perfect game is based on a true story. A group of boys from Monterey, Mexico, become the first non-US team right. to win the Little League World Series. I'm trying to find out what year it came out in 2009. So it was right at the beginning of our identity politics. And uh, uh, you know what? As an adult at that point, Big John, I like the movies to be entertained. I, it just did not, I just had no desire. And I think America agreed with me. <laughs> I, I never heard of this movie being a breakout hit, a big monster hit. So maybe it was a nice little movie. These are nice movies in showing some history. Uh, but the Little League has never really interested me at all, the Little League World Series or, or that. Whenever that comes on, I just merely change the channel. Right. <laughs> Is that terrible okay, or what? Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Okay, uh, so in that choice, like I told you, my bracket, I didn't even I didn't even realize I hadn't selected the one, but I gave my preference to the Sandlot because I think I saw that one. Right, right, right. Yeah, I did the Sandlot too in that one, yeah. All right, now here's a classic. Now, people, this movie has been remade, I want to say at least once in the yeah. past 10 years, and it was terrible. It was remakes are becoming remakes, Big John. At one time, were special. I mean, the movie would be twenty to fifty years old. It would be a big deal for Hollywood. The big stars now they're spitting out remakes faster than the sailor goes through a woman on payday. Yeah, you know, it's a situation in which they just come, they just go. And I'm being serious. Yeah, Total remakes, Recall, Ray Schwarzenegger movie. Do you remember the sequel? I'm sorry, say that again. Total Recall, for example, great Schwarzenegger movie. Do yeah. you remember the sequel? I have no idea. Yeah, See, and that's my point is there's so many of them. But there's and, a uh, The Bad News Bears is the movie we're talking right. about. Right, and, and by the way, there's a difference between a sequel and a remake. A sequel is part two, if you want to think of it that way. So right. The Godfather is off, uh, part two is often referred to as the greatest sequel of all time. If you think of all the Star Wars movies, it's one sequel after another. Right, right, right. right a right. remake is like what happened to The Bad News Bears, where you had right. this great movie, the original with Walter Matthau and, a, and I think a 12 year old. And and a twelve year old um, Tatum O'Neill because I had a crush on her at that time. Yeah, yeah, J uh, J Jody Foster, uh, twelve year old. Uh, no, Jody Foster. Tatum O'Neill. Oh, what I'm sorry, it? Tatum O'Neill. You're right, not Jody Foster. I get the two confused. Tatum O'Neill. You're right. Uh, so that movie to me, and again, I grew up with that movie. A, a clear winner over Rookie of the Year. Rookie of the Year was about a high school teacher who made a comeback. Uh, at an advanced age, if I recall, right? No, no, that was it with no, Kevin no, Costner. No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Rookie of the year. Uh, I confused it with the rookie. Rookie of the year wasn't it with a kid who had some sort of arm surgery for some reason, and then he became. Oh, that's right, and then he could pitch ass. over hundred miles an hour. Yeah, so it's kind of Disney esque. It's yeah. Disney esque. Which, which kind of brings it brings up. Well, no, this is a good comparison. Like for example, uh, uh, the Natural versus uh, or the Field of Dreams versus Angels Outfield. I'm like, you know, that's a blowout bracket there. Yeah. You know, uh, but this one here, the Rookie of the Year versus the Bad News Bears. Uh, the Bad News Bears was about a team of misfits people. And Walter Matthau had to come in, and Tatum O'Neill was the girl. Obviously, it's a boys' game, and this is the seventies. But she really was a star the, pitcher, yeah. the kid with a great arm, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, whereas Rookie of the Year is, uh, it's like uh, even as a kid, you're like, well, that could be plausible. And why do we say that? Because literally every kid has actually been on a crappy team at one point or another that's just how life works so we could relate to the bad news bears we can relate to that era and the coach who they didn't talk to us how you doing john more like john get your ass out there and say oh wow walter, walter, walter Matthau was superb in that movie that's the well, grumpy that was that's what made it good yeah the grumpy um uh, uh you know, horrible person, coach. Drunk, you know? the grumpy drunk. I can't the remember. Drunk, the drunk, drinking game, on the sideline. Uh, yeah. The sponsor of the team was a bail bondsman, Chico's Bail Bonds. I even remember <laughs> the name of the team, right? Chico's Bail That's Bonds. The name of my best man, Chico. Right. <laughs> so yeah. So in that matchup, no doubt, bad news bears. Yeah. All right. Then comes a league of their own versus the rookie. Mm. If, uh, first of all, let's talk about the rookie. I'm trying to remember the rookie actually. Was I think that was way? another one with Costner. I think. And he played, it's based on a true life story of um, a career minor leaguer who retires, becomes a, a high school coach or a college coach, and his team makes a bet with him. If we win the championship, you have That's to right. fly out for a major league team. And it turns out that the guy has like a hundred mile an hour fastball. Yep. I and he actually that. got a cup of coffee with the Rangers, you know, like yeah. as a reliever. So that's what the rookie is about. Um, and, and it is with Dennis Quaid. Oh, Dennis Quaid, not uh, Kevin Costner, right? Sorry, my memory's gone. But anyway, um, and League of Their Own is the story, uh, again, fictionalized a bit about the Women's Professional Baseball League 
which was operating during World War II, essentially. Um, true story, because all dramatization. The, true, true story, all the men were off fighting war, like Ted Williams, for the most part. All the big stars were drafted back then. They didn't get the Furmans. So uh, Actually, most of them volunteered. Or they volunteered, you're Hollywood right. Back then. You're right, you're right. And um, they cared. So, so women stepped in. You know, the, the thing about World War II is women stepped into the factories because they had to, right? And, well, and, and who was the most famous woman? Fictional. Rosie the Riveter. That's right, Rosie yeah. the Riveter. And uh, baseball. Get bigger guns than us. <laughs> we can do it, gals. Um, but they also play baseball because people needed a distraction. And uh, it, and it's a it's a great movie. Uh, I I gave it to League of Their Own. Uh, Tom Hanks is great in it. Uh, no, the, the League of Their Own is 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 nothing like these kid movies. Uh, but it's a comedy, uh, and and yet it, it, it's 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 a very as subtle good as any baseball movie out yeah. there. Literally, just yeah. because of the chemistry of the women, Tom Hanks's performance. And uh, Tom Hanks, Gina Davis, uh, Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell had a great performance there before she became the Rosie, the, the, the <laughs> right. vile, ugly right. swine. She and Madonna yes. was in it too. Madonna. Yes, Madonna. All Madonna. the way May. Yeah. So, it was an awesome. Gina Davis, I think, was uh, was Gina a Davis. Yeah, she was the catcher. Um, yeah. You had the girl. What was her name? Lori something or other. She was one of those uh, riot girl, tank girls type of thing. I think. Uh, yeah, 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 tank yeah, girl. Yeah, tank girl. Another That's movie. a cool yeah. classic. Yeah, Laurie yeah, yeah. something. I don't remember her name. Yeah. But anyway, so it was a I great ensemble. Would be bigger. Yeah, and it was never great, became bigger. And it was a great ensemble cast and a great story. So yeah, I'll I'll take I'll take legal their own in that matchup. So far, we're lining up. We've got pretty much the same picks. Yeah. Then came 42 versus eight men out. I know the Jackie Robinson. I don't watch bios when it's fully based on the bio. So for example, uh, like we've talked about with winning time and the Lakers, you guys are enjoying the hell out of it because it's a dramatization, right? You know, so I, I'm pretty sure I'd enjoy it too. But pure play bios on that, I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've read it uh, on history in a, in a book on the internet everywhere, so I didn't even bother, you know. And by then, when 42 came out, we were in the heat of identity politics, so maybe that did. Uh, uh, help me out. And the reason I say that is in, when you get into such a divided political sphere, this is what happens. Good movies aren't watched. Uh, in, our, in our case with streaming and uh, 10 zillion other movies, uh, it's easy to find something else to watch. But 42 got a lot of accolades. I'm yeah, assuming you saw that. I, so I, loved, tell us about I it. loved 42. And I have to tell you, this was one of the one of the two in the first round of movies they had that I had a tough decision to make. I picked 42. Um, I, I don't like eight men out. Uh, not, I shouldn't say I don't like eight men out. I liked 42 better. Um, I don't think Jackie Robinson, I mean, Jackie Robinson gets a lot of accolades deservedly. Um, but in some ways I think he doesn't get enough accolades. Um, you know what? I, I, I think he does. I think what's been drowned out are the satchel pages of the world. Well, I was going to say who yeah. trailblazed it for him. And that, I was, to I, me, I was, that, that's that's a big disgrace because the Negro League had players who were actually a, absolutely better. satchel page. Josh. Yeah, Gibson. they were better than Jackie. But what did Jackie fit? He well, fit Jackie fit the role the where his bosses said white America will accept you. Well, yeah, and they so, not accept these guys. No, that's what it boiled down to. No, no, no. Branch <laughs> boiled down uh, acceptance. So, so they chose Jackie Robinson for other reasons too. But that was a big reason. Well, I was going to yeah. say, um, in some ways, he doesn't get enough accolades because there were better Negro, Negro, Black, African American, whatever the right term you want to use in this context is. There were better players. You mentioned yeah. Satchel Page, Josh Gibson. Some people were saying yeah. he's better than Bay, Babe Ruth. He was a, a catcher in the Negro leagues had more power than Ruth. He is. He was reputedly the only player to hit a baseball out of the old Yankee Stadium. Nobody had ever done that. Uh, Josh Gibson was the only one, allegedly, that did that, um, according to the sources at the time. So then the question was, why did the Dodgers, the Brooklyn Dodgers, pick um, Jackie Robinson? It was because of his character. Uh, the Dodgers felt that he had the personality where he would be able to withstand all the racism, the the temperament. Yeah, the, that was part he had of the it. right temperament. He was he was in the service. He he was you know he was well spoken. If that means anything, then conservative. He had, in other words, he had the values of America. He was very then. restrained, at least. Oh publicly. no, Jackie Robinson was a great player. Yeah, I'm just saying that one of the downsides that people in history have forgotten, except for the people who actually follow history, is what. The, the it's I don't want to say it's a disgrace, but the ignoring of 
other great uh, uh, players. Because at the end of the day, we are in a political divisive uh, uh, culture, society, where it's easy to hate one another. But what I always tell people and why I'm battling, you know, because of my family, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm battling also because you can hate somebody or some things you, because you're looking at it from afar. And when you start to encounter or learn these stories at a close up and in detail, if you are truly human, meaning you, you, you care about other people, right. you'll see the travesty and you will look beyond that skin color. You'll mm. look beyond that culture and you'll see a human being. Well, so when I look at the Negro League, I don't look at a Negro League. I look at human being. I know I'm not copying out. I'm just saying how I feel. Uh, I, I've even satchel pages as these were human beings who busted their tail, worked their tails off. And at the end of the day, they really didn't. It's a cycle of life where you have generations, generations blazing the trail for you. Yet when they leave this earth, they really gain nothing for themselves as much as what they gained and gave society. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, that's just re like you said, that's just reality. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm but, not, uh, I, I mean, Satchel Page, especially played in the major leagues. First of all, nobody knew how old he really was. Right. right. Because his birth records had been lost or not kept or whatever. He could have been anywhere from 50 to 60 when he retired. Nobody really knows. Yeah. Uh, he was an older man when he was still pitching. Minnie Minoso was another guy. I think he got, he's the oldest player to ever get a hit in the major leagues, you know? So a lot of these guys who were in the Negro leagues initially, who were stars of the Negro leagues, um, without a doubt, could have been major, major, major league stars, you know, and uh, you're right. But back to the movies, I picked 42, you picked eight men out. So that's the first one we've diverged on. Right. And I picked eight men out uh, again. I talked about it earlier to me, eight men out was just a movie that enlightened me from the perspective of history and corruption and the destruction of, of the innocent. So it kind of encompassed a lot for me in that movie. As far as remembering the movie, I saw it once and that was on HBO. Uh, and I remember, and I'll never forget because he's famous, is how young, I mean, now that I'm older, how young John Cusack was in, in, in getting his start. The movie came out in 1988. Right. So it's been around for a while. But to me, it brings everything. It brings history, a good story. Uh, it, it, it's not your traditional feel-good baseball movie. It's your traditional, this is what baseball was. And again, right. the scenery. Uh, and maybe as a kid, the Big Red Machine was my favorite team. So I had that tie-in. It was the, Red, right. the, the Cincinnati Reds that uh, that that won that World, that, that World Series. So overall, and it was a great cast. Uh, it, 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 as I've said, I had Jason uh, uh, Alexander, I mean, John Cusack, Jason Alexander, uh, actually John Mahoney, people who don't know John Mahoney, John Mahoney was in uh, Frazier, played the father, he was the father in Frazier, you know, yeah. Michael Rooker, Charlie Sheen, D.B. Sweeney, these were the young studs of that era, you know, coming up, it even had studs Turco, so it was a good movie, I enjoyed it, and it kind of made its impact, so and because I haven't seen 42 and I, and I probably will eventually see 42, sure. see, you know, when it comes on. So, but I went with eight men out because that is the standalone, my favorite. When I think baseball movies, it's the first one that always comes out to mind. Now here's one that should be a fun one. Uh, 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 Major League versus Trouble with the Curve. Trouble, I'm a huge Clint Eastwood hand, fan. I can say I've literally seen every movie, but when this movie came out, it kind of came and went. I just, you know, I just hadn't, and maybe because it didn't get good reviews, it was a mediocre movie in terms of his financial hits. And overall, so I, yeah, I kind of came and went. It was on the boob tube once and I turned it on and I changed the channel. Uh, so Major League was our era as kids, you know, uh, as we were the young adults oh, maybe, coming maybe. in. Yeah, Major League, I already said that's probably my favorite one. So you know how my bracket is going to eventually turn out. But uh, Trouble with the Curve I didn't like. I think it, it's it's Clint Eastwood slowly becoming a woman in old age. Everything he has now is about emotions and deep feelings and all that. It's no, not. No, no, no. You think that Sniper movie, that true story, uh, uh, was a few good movie? Which one? Uh, uh, American Sniper? No, not uh, uh, Sniper. The one with uh, the Navy SEAL who uh, gets captured behind lines after uh, they decide not to kill this. Oh, that one. Or... Yeah. The, I, well, I mean the ones he stars in, I guess, because yeah. like when you think about uh, Gran Torino, when you think about Trouble with the Curve, when you think about Million Dollar Baby, these are all movies that Clint both directed and stars in. 
But they're those always, were hits. They're I, always, I, I know where you're going, John. No, but for me personally, I'm saying I, I hate overly sappy emotional movies. I hate them. Um, no, no, I, no like, I, I get that. I'm the same way. And, and the truth of the matter is, the movies you mentioned outside of Trouble with the Curve were all deep. Oh, dramas. I agree. I agree. Wow. The Trouble true. with the Curve, I think, was more along the Disney esque lines. Well, than it that's was well, the it Tareem, was supposed Grand to be Torino lines. It was supposed to be Amy Adams who plays his daughter reconnecting with her father yeah. using, because he's an old baseball scout. He's been on the road his whole life, so it was supposed to be her reconnecting with him via baseball, right? Right. So. Right. So yeah, I could t- listen. Like I said, it's it's Clint Eastwood slowly turning into a woman in his old age because every well, every chick I know loved that movie. So it's a chick flick, and, and it uh, didn't make money compared to his other. Doesn't matter. It's a chick it was, flick. So well, that's my point. Is yeah. most people would agree with you. That's not a Clint Eastwood movie. Yeah. It's kind of like the one that just came out or is coming out, or he plays his old worn down cowboy. Yeah, of course he has to play those roles now. It's the same but thing. he goes to Mexico. Uh, uh, to rescue this little kid and they bond coming up or something to that nature or i haven't seen the one with him being a mule i heard that was pretty good there i i saw that one it was entertaining it was yeah, entertaining so, uh, yeah. but you're right i mean the man's in his 90s still kicking yeah. and he's never <laughs> abandoned his right. values yeah. for hollywood you know so uh, you can't help but admire him so tell us about major league oh it, major league is everything i ever went through but who was a big star well, Charlie Sheen is in it. Um, who else is in it? Uh, I would say Tom uh, Berenger. Uh, Tom Berenger, Rene Russo. Um, who's the, the big that I like? Uh, the Wesley big Snipes. Black. Wesley Snipes oh. is in it. Well, who's the big, big black guy that nobody messed with, like from Jamaica? Who was that actor? Oh, he's the guy who does. He was in Twenty Four, and he also does the Allstate commercials. The guy with the deep voice. Um, oh, he is he, that was him. He played Serrano in the movie. I, uh, but that's the actor's name, and uh, I apologize, I can't remember his name, but he's one of those great character actors. Uh, but th- I think Serrano and that guy are one and the same. I was shocked. I could be wrong, but I think that's You him. mean the Allstate guy, the guy from 24, I played that role? So. I think so. Yeah, they shaved his head and gave him a Cuban accent. I'm, I'm almost positive, but I, I, I had no idea. I allow, for, I allow for the possibility. But anyway, I love Major League A because it's a comedy. B, because... When I played ball coming up, it was like I could um, I could identify with every character on that team. All my friends who were on teams with me can identify ourselves in those movies. Like every everybody that I played with that saw that movie says, John, that old pitcher who's got like Vaseline and Vagisil and all that stuff hidden on him and he puts snot on the ball and all that. He goes, that's you. That's you. Somebody saw you and wrote that role because I used to pitch in high school and I was never overpowering. I had like 10 different pitches, all of them mediocre, but you never knew what was coming. So the guy says, that's you, you know, and then there was this other guy we knew who was Charlie Sheen, you know, like he would show up. There's always a Charlie Sheen. That's why I think it was a big hit. And John, you're right. Dennis Haysburg. There you go. Good memory. I would never have guessed. I just remember he was hilarious in the movie. Hey, yeah, and maybe that's because I'm Latino, understanding yeah. different well, cultures. He was, he was into Santeria. Yeah, exactly. That's part. what I'm saying. So when I saw his character, I immediately related because I'm being stereotypical here, I guess. But when you go back to the jungle in Panama uh, and you go to these little towns, communities, there's there's always, what do they call it? The snake uh, tongue or whatever type religion. Uh, uh, oh, the charismatic. Yeah, well, well they yeah, they get into the tent, the revival types. I mean, so, so when yeah. I saw his characters, I kept relating to that. I never experienced that, but I went to one or two of them because as a kid and somebody's watching, you get dragged sometimes. But oh, I was wow. never like, this is our life, this is this. Have you never uh, been to a Santeria? Have you been around folks who practice Santeria? Yes, I'm saying I have, but they I was American living not there. Oh. So they always protected me, were careful of me. So I never got the experience those type of things but oh yeah i, saw I knew it. of them yeah. i knew it's my grandmother she was into these tent revivals you know the, but santeria santeria isn't even really tent revivals as much as it's like it's it's a combination of voodoo christian it's like all rolled into one and it's like i know no like, no no john i'm referring to the differences of the cultures. Meaning oh, sure. Yeah, yeah I agree. Can't, I agree. can't yeah, relate yeah. To, to, to that side of it. Yeah. So it wasn't that I was familiar with it as much as I was laughing at, but they don't get it because I've been through that experience. What? 
y'all eat rice and beans every day? <laughs> yeah, we do with a different meat, you know, yeah, with platanos yeah. on the side. That's just a third world, you know. So it was those type of little differences or the shock when they would see my mom and then they would see me. That's your mom. Every time, that's your mom because it's a short little Asian. And then when she would start speaking Spanish, because I never spoke Spanish at school, right. English. So I really related to Dennis Haysbert's. But Charlie Sheen played your typical uh iconic role of that era because remember that was a john hughes era you know and this wasn't a teen flick like that but that whole shtick that's what was oozing out through he was the rebel the zone, he was the, the, the rebel with, cars and automobiles type movie right. he was a rebel with a heart of gold yeah it was it was it was a great movie it was a great ensemble cast and like i said it's it's genius was that you could relate like if you played baseball at any level you could relate to that movie because that team had every character that every baseball player has ever uh, been a part of uh, on any level. Like, I don't care if it's Little League, high school, right. college, minor league, it doesn't matter. You've run I mean, into those guys. Exactly. Corbin Burnson was in it, but it also oh, I forgot players. about him. Steve Yeager exactly. was there. Uh, Euchre, Bob Euchre. Y'all may not remember Bob Euchre people, but in the 80s and 90s, there was a battle. Miller Light or Miller, if I remember. And he was in the middle of, I mean, it was choreographed marketing battle. It was and, less uh, filling versus taste great for yeah, Miller Light. Yeah, and uh, Euchre, uh, uh, he was part of that. But he kind of became famous for just being out there. He was never out there, but he came across as out there. Well, he was very famous as more as an announcer than a ball player. People forget he right. used to be a catcher, but he was a horror. Even he says he was one of the worst players. He says, um, Someone said to him, how did you end up catching somebody like Bob Gibson, I think? And he goes, very simple. He goes, when Bob Gibson threw it, I just picked it up after it rolled to the backstop because he was a horrible catcher. And he, he was a Cleveland it. Indians announcer, right? Uh, it, uh, at some point, yeah, he was the Indians announcer in real life. He, he was a regular on um, The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Like, he, he became a more of a pop culture guy. But you yeah. know what? He was one of the first celebrities you could say that was more famous for being Bob Euchre than actually anything he'd done. And I say that because that's today, that's what an influencer is. You yeah. know, there's just, I mean, let's be honest. Instagram is a, is a, the, the, the digital media of influencers because of soft porn. <laughs> you know, that's what it's become. All right, let's move on. Now, here's one that's interesting for me. Bull Durham versus Moneyball. Most mm -hmm. people would have expected me to go with Moneyball, but the truth is we kind of were the second part of Moneyball in terms of the baseball geeks uh, creating trailblazing uh, analytics and then baseball commercializing it. And that's the part of the world we were in. Uh, so I found Moneyball all right. Nothing great. You know, it's it's just another movie, but I found Bull Durham kind of like Major League, completely different movies, but from that big hair era, everything was over the top, just one of those grandiose movies. And again, another baseball movie with who? Kevin Costner. Uh, and, and I can't remember his sidekick, but the pitcher, the, the young kid. He, he Tim Robbins. Just, Tim Robbins, that's it. Tim Robbins is an asshole. And, I actually, and by the way, here's a, a tree of fact. Tim <laughs> Robbins and Susan Sarandon ended it up they That's were right. never married, but they were together for like 25 years. They met on Bull Durham. Yeah, no, no, no. Susan uh, Sarandon was in Bull Durham. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. She was hot then. That, oh, that yeah, was, yeah, yeah, she, yeah. she was one of these 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 women uh, of the era that that people don't realize in the 80s, it was the era of the silicone breasts and skinny woman. Well, Susan Sarandon was top heavy with natural breasts. She had a more mature... Uh, intellectual look uh, but she had the body and uh, she was a great actress and uh, at the time she was probably one of the I would assume of that era sought out leading ladies and uh, her and Tim Robbins were really they actually looked good together on screen at least yeah I met uh, Tim Robbins once uh, uh, a rude guy but he's probably his own world uh, opening the door into the Starbucks and all that yeah. and it, uh, uh, Ryan I think Ryan Bonini was my former partner he goes hey, that, 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 that's that's Tim Robbins. And I go, yeah, that's an asshole there. Do you see that? Well, pretty rude. He didn't give space. I think we were walking, you know, just not paying attention. Right. But at the time I was like, what an asshole. You know, how about, how about, I guess I do find it offensive when people won't do a simple, excuse me, or thank you when you right. do something like right. that. Exactly. Uh, Cause that's my nature. And uh, I do judge too harshly. I just realized what an asshole, you know? So Bull Durham though, to me was magic. Moneyball was just another good, solid, high,
Hollywood flick. And to me, it's no contest. Bull Durham has reached iconic status. Moneyball is a wannabe iconic status because the geeks all think it's iconic because it's Moneyball. You know, but Brad oh. Pitt did a great job. So did the fat kid, uh, 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 the comedian, uh, did 21 Jump Street. Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill is actually a phenomenal actor. I gave him a lot of credit in that movie. That was a coming out movie in terms of how I looked at Jonah uh, uh, Hill because he'd always done comedy. And he, even though it was a comedic style movie with laughs and all, it wasn't a comedy. It was just a movie that, that had a lot of laughs in it. What about I, you, Big John? I, I, I have to tell you, this is probably the closest one I had to choose from. I said there were only one or two. This one's the closest one. I actually went with Moneyball. Um, I enjoyed... Like I had obviously read about um, uh, Moneyball and um, uh, Billy Bean, who was the, the, the GM who implemented it. Uh, and I think it changed baseball, obviously. The way well, baseball no, that's in real life. Right? Yeah, in real yeah, life. Yeah. So much to your point earlier about Eight Men Out being uh, a part of history and trying to portray an era and all that that people may not have been aware of. I liked Moneyball for the same reasons that you probably didn't like it, which was I liked it because it did give, I think, an accurate portrayal of how these uh, sabermetrics and, and statistics and data analysis came in. Being a data geek myself, um, I can't tell you how many data scientists, professional guys with PhDs in this, in this line of work, all love Moneyball because oh, I enjoyed it. Know, Don't get me wrong. You know, it showed a lot. It, yeah. I and and, and actually, you. a lot of people don't realize that baseball is probably the best sport to use as a laboratory for data science. Like uh, when you're trying to teach principles of data science to, to kids in school coming up, you almost always end up using baseball as as uh, the the setting for something, right? When you think of but something, John, that's because baseball is the first major sport, and it's actually kept all its data. Yes, I agree. Track, yes. 140, 140, 160 games a year. Uh, uh, but eventually, you can do the same thing with any long term sport. Any day. No, I, I don't disagree with you, but I'm saying, given its status and everything, it, it is what it is, you know. But right. I, anyway, so I just, and because I had picked Major League, I, I said, well, I've got that sort of ensemble baseball comedy, which is what Bull Durham is. So I said, I'm going to go with Moneyball on this one. So that's where we kind yeah. of split, but it was no, very right, close. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I could have picked For the record, one. I enjoyed Moneyball, but it's no Bull Durham. All right. Yeah. Uh, I guess, too, part of it was, uh, 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 a lot of the baseball geeks are assholes too in our industry. <laughs> Not towards us, but you just, there's something about that. They truly live up. And I don't care if this stereotype, the thing about me and what I've done in this industry, I can say it is they tend to be snarky. They tend to have attitudes and they tend to think they're better than people so maybe that's something and, and not all of them I, i've met some great guys in the baseball industry uh ron chandler's probably the most well-known data guy uh i haven't spoken to chandler in years i remember the last time i spoke to him uh, uh i didn't chastise him but he was getting into the hall of fame and they giving a speech i said ron i love you great speech wonderful what about the wife? <laughs> he forgot to thank the wife. He's like, oh, <laughs> you know, because in our jobs and having trailblazers and having done this, it's a grind. So yeah. I always tell, and this is this is a lesson for anybody who wants to start a small business. You got to have your family behind you because if you don't have your family behind you with the hours necessary to build that small business, uh, you're going to get divorced. You're going to get yeah. separated or you're going to have some kind of problems. You're going to have yep. trouble overcoming because there's a disconnect because you're not on the same page. And here's the problem. Uh, my, my two cents of advice towards, towards these individuals. Every person I've met who wants to start a business believes they can set up the business, get it going. Then it's just a simple nine to five job and they have everybody else working for them. That's not how life works. That mm -hmm. works at a corporation that starts a new division because they have the money they can afford to lose. But even then, that's a cutthroat world with people moving up. So right. it's one of the biggest myths in life. You know, oh, I, I just want to do what I love and do it nine to five. No. No. So always make sure your loved ones, your family and your friends are on board because you're going to lose friends, too, because there's something funny about society and human nature. A lot of our peers don't want us to do better than they are doing. Not that they hate us, don't want us to succeed. But there's that there's that. Well, there's Somebody, that competition. Let's be honest. Everyone in like does it for well, they don't them. like it when you're competing to better yourself and they're not. No, it agreed, makes them agreed. feel less yeah. of themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I right. agree.
All right, I was going to say, let's move on a little bit because we're running a little short on time, but we know how that was the first bracket. That was every movie in the bracket. The way this wound out was you ended up uh, out of this start, you ended up with eight men out over the natural. Though That was your finals. Eight men out right. over the natural. And that was easy, only because when I started looking at the baseball movies, when I saw the natural, it was like finding that, rediscovering that gold mine. Whereas eight men out, I've never forgotten. There but I go. enjoyed both movies the same. Uh, a pure play, uh, a chick flick, especially for us older guys, when we sit in front of the couch, you know? It's a good one to put on with the wife. And uh, Eight Men Out, it's just a good one if you're a historical and baseball fan and uh, 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 want to see one angle of Shoeless Joe Jackson and, and those players of that right. era. How truthful it is, I have no clue, yeah. but it left its impact. Yeah. You, on the other hand, uh, went with, Two that did not surprise me. People, John's a comedian at heart. He and I off camera argue the libertarian uh, rights and wrongs. And what makes it tougher to argue with John is he has this comedic belief in him. And we all know and we all believe, the average person at least does, that the comedian circle, it's hands off because you can talk and how you want, say what you want and do what you want. So it was very easy for me to see you have the bad news bears and major league as your final. Right, yeah, yeah. You know? And uh, it was a no brainer uh, yeah. because at, at the heart, you are a little bit of various characters from major league. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Uh, I, I'm definitely the old pitcher in that movie. Like everyone says it, even when I was 21, I was the old pitcher in that movie. So absolutely. The bad news bears surprised me because I tried to do it really honestly as I went through the brackets. And I found that the Bad News Bears, first of all, Walter Matthau, for people who may not know, he was the original Oscar Madison in The Odd Couple. Um, well, hell, he, John, how many people even know The Odd Couple? Exactly. So, well, people One might remember the Oscar and Felix. And Oscar and Felix, right? Era. Um, but but Walter Matthau himself was a great comedic actor. He wasn't yes. a stand-up comedian, but he was a, he was a really good comedic actor. And uh, I found myself surprised gravitating back to select, as I went through the brackets, the Bad News Bears. A, because it's a comedy, and but also because it's a feel-good kids movie that stuck with me from when I was growing up. And it has that baseball theme. So uh, it was close, but I got the major leagues out of that. And yeah, absolutely. Honestly, the only one I had trouble with was Bull Durham versus Moneyball. And even then, I didn't really have much trouble. Yeah, that was definitely the toughest. Uh, yeah, these were all easy to me, which I guess it shows in my mind I've already uh, uh, set what oh, I like. Let me ask you this. Were there any movies you were surprised were not on the list? You know, I can't tell you offhand, but when I was doing my research, I was. What I found more surprising was looking at top baseball lists and seeing a movie like The Natural, not part of that. Or Well, if, or, if you didn't have any that came to mind, I'll tell you two that came to my mind right away that I was shocked weren't on this list. One was The Pride of the Yankees. Well, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, those, the, but those were from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, some of these movies, like Bang the Drum Slowly. That's uh, the that, other one. From that, the that one hit me hard uh, when I saw it as a kid. Uh, 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 in fact, I just don't remember. I think the catcher had cancer or something like that. Yeah, so, and wait, here's something. And by the way, that's the contemporary movie of, say, the Bad News Bears. They came out around the same era. But let me ask you this. Who played the catcher who had the disease? Oh, I can't remember. I saw, dude, you'll I be shocked. Was maybe 10 when I give you his name, you'll movie. be shocked. Who? Robert De Niro. Oh, oh, wow. And wow. the pitcher who became his best friend was Michael Moriarty, who people might remember was the original. LA Law. Um, no, or not, uh, on, LA order, law, on order. On order. Yeah. He was the original DA, uh, Ben Stone. He's coming so, back. And he's coming. Oh, is he good for him? Because Law and he, Order's making a comeback. It may have started already. It did, and but I he's read. not on he's it. He's a great character actor. Yeah, but he's not on it. It's Sam Waterston that's on it. But anyway. No, no. Sam Waterston plays the uh, uh, DA. The DA, yeah. The DA, yeah. 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 I but thought anyway, Michael Moriarty was signed too. Ma Michael Moriarty um, quit Hollywood for political reasons. Yes, he did. Right? Yes, he uh, he's more of a conservative Canada. and he moved back to Canada. But yeah. That movie, Bang the Drum Slowly, came out around the same time as Brian's song, which was the football version. Ah, which was it the makes life sense. Story. Competing studios. Well, we got to do our own, you know? Right. Brian's song came out, which was the story of Walter Payton and Brian Piccolo, which was a real life story. And it was Gail Sayers and um, James Kahn, the guy who played right. Sonny in The Godfather. So Brian Piccolo was... was uh, the running, the fullback who used to block for Gail Sayers, uh, the great Chicago running back, uh, he got cancer and died. And that's right. a true story. In the middle of the season, uh, he just, there was nothing they could do. 
Right. Bang the Drum right. story is a completely fictionalized drama, but it was clearly made as the baseball version of Brian's song, I think. Uh, but anyway, I'm surprised that it wasn't picked in this bracket at all between that and Pride of the Yankees. Uh, but again, if you even tell me that it, Pride of the Yankees because it was way old, fair enough. But um, I, I'm surprised Bang the Drum Slowly wasn't on there. Right, right. So there were a couple, like when I came across it. But there's been so many baseball movies. And you're right. I, I thought Michael Moriarty had, I read something about him in the new Law and Order. It looks like nothing came about. But you're right. He's a very fascinating individual. Uh, and we don't have time to talk about him. But he's worth looking up in Wikipedia or IMDb. I actually enjoyed him tremendously in the Clint Eastwood film, uh, Pale Rider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that was kind of like a, uh, a I don't want to say a remake, but uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the other one where he's he's already been killed off, comes back, you know, the, does in the bad guys. Look, I love those kind of movies, you know. <laughs> then I look at my boss. Hey, if you're going to be on IMDb looking people up, you might as well look up Big John. There you go. I have looked you up. Yeah, and I'm like, where's all that money to fund our company? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. So let's move on to our final topic of the night before we talk a little bit about TNT. Pete Rose. Yes. And uh, Big John, who is Pete Rose, better known as Charlie Hustle? Give us a couple of highlights uh, oh uh, in goodness. terms of his overall big records. Yeah, look, I mean, Pete Rose, Hall of Famer, um, really, if, if you grew up in the 70s, especially, part of the Big Red Machine. That's uh, right. Incredible player, uh, typically played infield, but he, he, he could play anywhere on the field except pitcher and catcher, but he was basically a third baseman, first baseman for most of his career. Um, started out with the Reds, moved on uh, to the Phillies. The Reds and the Phillies are basically the two teams he's known for. He had a cup of coffee with the Expos. Didn't he win a World Series with the Phillies? Yes, I think he did. Yeah, um, yeah, in eighty, it was either nineteen. I think it was nineteen eighty that he won with the oh, Phillies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he was part of the Big Red Machine in the seventies, obviously. Um, uh, all time hits leader, I think. Uh, past Ty Cobb, I believe. Um, he won the MVP in the National League. He's a three time series champion. He was a, like an All Star, something like 16, 17 times. Seventeen times. Um. He, he actually was pretty good with the glove too. He won, he yes. won a couple of golden gloves um, and he's part of the all century team. Uh, and then and, after and that's impressive because most all century teams in anything with all movies, all action, all whatever, 85% of them tend to be the actors from the last 15, 20 years. And right, because that's what people remember. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and um, he's not been forgotten. And then the other thing is equally after he ended his playing career, he became a major league manager. <laughs> So and that's lot, when he got in trouble. Uh, yeah, a lot like Joe Torre, uh, uh, Casey Stengel, all these guys who, who used to be players became managers, Dusty Baker. Uh, so he, he, he went into managing. Now, to your point, that's where he got in trouble. Oh, that's uh, when he got caught. Fair enough. Who knows how long he had been doing it. But yeah, you're right. Um, he basically um, got thrown. He got banned from baseball for life by the commissioner, uh, Peter Uberoth. Was it Uberoth who ended up? Uh... No, no. Uberoth was one who got it started, but Uberoth was outgoing. Right. So he it? let the nerd, Bart Giamatti. Giamatti. Yeah, I remember. I wasn't sure who actually kicked them out. But, but Giamatti you... was a National League president who that season, before the allegations came to light, had suspended him for uh, 30 days or 30 games, right. one of the two, for uh, bumping into a, a, a ref. Right. And and for people, the other ones that people, I forgot to mention, the other thing Pete Rose was famous for, he was nicknamed Charlie Hustle is he never gave up on a play. If you walked him on four pitches, he would sprint the first base on, on, the, uh, on a walk. Uh, he never took, it, it took a ground ball off. He was always hustling. And that's why as a manager, he put that in his players. He's also famous for, during an all-star game of all things, ending Ray Fossey's career. That's Ray right. Fossey was a catcher for the uh, Oakland A's, I think. And it's an all-star game. And there was a bang, bang play at the plate. Pete Rose came in like a linebacker put his shoulder into Fossey, uh, basically injured him, and for, for all intents and purposes, ended an all-star's career. Uh, yeah, you know what? And people who believe in karma, this is Pete Rose's karma because that was a cheap play. Yep. He never apologized. He still defends it. He was a punk. He was a piece yeah. of shit punk in that move, moment. And yeah. I view all this as karma. Well, yeah. Pete, you're an asshole. You're an asshole I, to a lot of people. I yeah. might, I, I'll agree with you on that. He, he certainly yeah. had, if so, anybody had it coming, it was him. But anyway, yeah. he got caught 
long story short, he got caught uh, making bets on baseball, uh, which was strictly illegal at the time. Even if the betting was legal in Vegas. No, it's illegal today. Right. Well. And, and at the time, too. But uh, uh, all, all sports across the board, it is illegal for players to bet on those. those right. Players. So uh, as a manager, especially now, his when they caught him, his defense was I never bet on the race to lose. No, no, no. His first defense was I bet on all the other sports, but not baseball. Then it came right. out. When 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 he was being tracked down, they, they figured out they figured that Pete Rose was betting every night up to ten thousand a day. Other people were saying he was betting every night was only about two thousand. I believe the latter only because somebody today will believe the former, but the the contracts of those eras were were not what you see today, and they weren't necessarily guaranteed. Uh, so the reason he accepted his his ban was uh, because you're right. Go on. He he says he bet why. Well, he says he bet on his team to win. That's right. He said every single bet he made was to win. And that's why he accepted the, came to the agreement to accept the permanent ban was because technically speaking, uh, he couldn't bet whether it was on his team or not. So I think that was the, his lawyer probably told Pete, you're caught, you're busted. There's just, you know, this is all going to come out. And uh, he was trying to make lemonade out of lemons at that point, because in addition to being banned, which was going to happen regardless, because he had, the, like you said, they caught him red-handed betting. Like there was no doubt that he was betting. It, it was Rule Twenty One misconduct betting on ball games. Right. So he was caught. He, there's no way he could deny it. Right. He did get something out of it, though. What did he get out of it? Well, I was going to say what he was trying to do by claiming whether it's true or not that he only bet on the Reds to win. He was trying to save his public persona. He was trying to save his PR work. He was trying to save his off the field. Um, he was trying to save his career as a as, yeah. as a human being. Yeah, because well, he, he wanted baseball. to make money as endorsements yeah. and stuff like that as a spokesperson, which to some extent he did. You know, um, not really, not because he was actually blackballed there and lost a lot of deals. I mean, nobody he was tainted. Remember, John, this was an era still at that time where we were all in agreement. He's wrong. It's illegal. It's a, it was the sanctity and the purity of the game. Now, opinions has changed with society as we've gotten, uh, we've moved forward. But back then, nobody. No, no, there's died. no, yeah, there's no justification. Just like with, uh, in football, it was Alex Karras, Paul Harning, I think. Uh, there were three Oh, yeah, guys. football, Paul, Paul Harning and Alex Karras in the fifth, in the 60s. But yeah, they 60. were the last ones to get the slap on the wrist. Right. They got suspended for a year or two, I think, but they yeah, were like a year, but back. they were allowed. That was it. It, it were, was it, but they were allowed to come back. Uh, right. They were like, the last ones. Yeah. That, that was the last time that's happened. Yeah. Now real quick for people, the re Pete Rose has been, has applied for reinstatement. Pete Rose may have been under the belief after a certain amount of time, he would apply for reinstatement and it, it passed. Bart Giamatti came out forcefully said, we never agree to that. He may think that, but that's not the case. And we're not going to sit there and just approve him. In essence, that's what Giamatti said. Ironically, Giamatti died like five or eight months later, one of the shortest tenures as baseball commissioner. In 1992, Rose applied for reinstatement under Faye Vincent, who was an asshole, who replaced Giamatti. No. 98, they didn't even have to say no. They just don't have to, they just ignored the application. In 1998, Rose applied for reinstatement under, under the corrupt commissioner, Bud Seelig. In March 2003, and he's corrupt because he knew there was a steroid uh, situation in right. baseball, a bad right, one. Right. But baseball was hurting so badly. He, they put the health of players ahead of, uh, I know you believe what you believe, but he put the health of his players uh, ahead of the game, or he put the game ahead of the health of uh, players. Uh, in 2003, Silly acknowledged he was considering Rose's application. Not, and that was all we heard. In 2015, Rose's representatives applied for reinstatement. Now, Rob Manfred was a commissioner. He actually came out with information stating why. Rose is living in Vegas. He showed no remorse. And we still forbid players, managers, and coaches to gamble on baseball, whether legal or otherwise. And Rose, by that time, was openly legally betting. Uh, Rose also didn't have a mature understanding of his wrongful conduct and the damage it causes, what Manfred said. And I agree. Uh, yeah. I believe Rose should be reinstated, but Manfred was absolutely right on all counts. So you couldn't really argue. You know, I think as fans, we were just hoping somebody would go, okay, you paid your penance. But Manfred was, I think the fact that Rose still uh, thought he didn't do anything wrong, I, I think that, that was a major problem. So where does this put in Big John regarding the Hall of Fame? Will we ever see him in the Hall of Fame? Can he even qualify to be on the ballot? Well, 
he can't legally whether it's right or not i don't know um well he's barred from hall of fame eligibility i think that's horrible um it's one thing to be banned from the game but his accomplishments were his accomplishments you can't even make the argument that there's proof that he gambled while he was a player so if you want to keep him out on his managerial record that's fine but he's the all-time hits leader he's the all-time leader in games played so you what you're saying is what he did on the field is all we should be looking at. For this particular thing, yes. Because unlike steroids, where you can make the argument that like, oh, Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, all these guys set their home run records on the juice and the juice was illegal. Fair enough. Like you, or, or Roger Clemens. Clemens. Yeah, like I agree. Fair enough. There might be doubt. Leave it up to each voter. But to ban someone for something he did after his career as a player, like I said, if you want to end his, like, if you want to vote on his eligibility up for his playing career and exclude the managerial part, fine, because he gets in as a player. He, he probably wouldn't get in as a manager, but he gets in as a player without a doubt. He's a first ballot, almost unanimous choice as He's a player. He's arguably one of the greatest baseball players of any era. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Wow. I mean, there was absolutely, there was nothing he couldn't do. Now, so, has he ever admitted to the gambling, though, Big John? I don't think so. I mean, he's been, like like you said, he he reads his apologies like, well, then, like a hostage. I like got breaking hostage. news for you, brother. He actually wanted to promote his book. So yeah, right about I, the like Hall I of said, Fame I, in 2004, he came, through his book, he came out and said he, he publicly admitted to betting on baseball and other sports while managing the Reds and playing for them. So actually, he came clean. And the belief is he thought coming clean at that point would ease his entry, would, would allow him back yeah. in, but it would cause a backlash. Everybody looked at him as you're doing this for your book. You know, yeah, it's all and about they, money with you, Charlie. And, and he probably was it's all about money. Yeah, and he probably was. Look, I understand why they're not making him eligible, but at the same time, should he be in the Hall of Fame? Yes. Should he be eligible or not? I leave that. I, I really, I, I can't work myself up one way or another over it, to be honest with you. It's, now, it's I mean, the part of that is because it's been so long. I'm sure when you were younger, you probably had more uh, opinionated well, thoughts. Well, listen, like I said, uh, like I'm a libertarian. I believe in free association. It's their club. It's the Hall of Fame. It's baseball's club. They Good get the point. Set, they get to set their own rules, right? And that's what separates you from your leftist libertarian buds who believe their beliefs should be enacted out of because they're the right ones. But right. John, let's move on to gambling today. Uh, I'm going to step in here because I uh, 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 this is my domain there for quite a while, being involved in the FSTA, sure. being part of that core. Uh, so how did we get to this path? We got to this path because the Fantasy Sports Trade Association, now known as the Fantasy Sports Gaming Association, may as well say Gambling Association, right. uh, created a carve-out. We fought for that carve-out. Right. Uh, John Kyle, senator from Arizona, was after our industry. Uh, during that whole carve-out, my again, big picture. My fear was simple. I kept telling people, we this is eventually going to be corrupted because an outside party is going to force gambling using this carve out. And that's what actually happened. Daily fantasy sports eventually made that happen. They abused the carve out. They pretended they were fantasy, kept saying it's a game of skill. Look, poker's a game of skill. The only gambling that I would sit there as an analogy would say is no game of skill is the one where you throw the ball that hits red and black. You know, that's it. But poker, blackjack, all those are games of skill. So I was never in the uh, camp that said fantasy sports is a game of skill. That's why it's not gambling. Now, I went along with it because it was a way to get a carve out. But the truth of the matter, fantasy sports, traditionally speaking, is not gambling because an average fantasy sports player will spend $100 to win $10. It's about bragging rights for us. And that's why the niche struggled for corporate type uh, in growth, meaning the, the revenue wasn't really there like they wanted. With Daily Fantasy, you have to create a deposit first. A deposit goes hand in hand with gambling, meaning you got to give us your money first. And that's what we're going to pull from when you lose. Because in gambling, you always lose eventually. There are a handful of people who can win consistently and they're the studs because they use algorithms. It's corrupt, but it's legal. So, uh, 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 what turned this around was the SCOTUS decision we've talked about in 
past podcast in New Jersey that said the federal government has no right to dictate to a state whether they can or can't have gambling, sports betting, horse racing, highlight, whatever. And that's where we're at now. Because of that now, money has been heavily invested and has been for years into daily fantasy sites. They may be making money now, but back early on, they weren't. And I believe they're still going to struggle because you don't need as much knowledge to do a parlay of teams versus you do a player's. It's pretty much that simple. Where it will thrive, I think, is what you guys call prop bets. And again, I don't gamble because I have an addictive personality. And if I gambled, I'd be broke. It's that simple. You know, uh, so NBA has led the way with the gambling stance, meaning they want gambling, gambling, gambling. They're a corrupt system in itself. They'll support everything bad about China and not say one word why because of money. They're the worst of the lot, but the other leagues are just as bad. They just weren't as vocal as the NBA. Baseball right. has made deals with these daily fantasy sites that have gambling in stadiums, that have partnerships with these gamblings. Uh, the only change is MLB's gambling policy is it's still illegal for players, but everything else is a free for all because all they care about is money. They've embraced the gambling industry, advertising on telecast, and plan permanent sports books at baseball stadiums. Brings us to what, John? I'll let you take it from here. Who is Charlie Blackman and what did he do? Well, he's a Rockies outfielder, and he was given permission, if, if, I'm, if I've got it correctly, he was given permission to sign the deal with one of the daily fantasy sites. To... All right, real quick. Does he really legally, we're not lawyers, but logically speaking, does he really need permission when baseball teams individually in the league itself is signed partnership deals with all these uh, sports books? Well, to the extent that if he's bound by contract to do so, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I would imagine. Like, look, mor morally, morally, yeah. I think there is an argument to be made about players refraining from gambling in games that they participate in. Well, 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 time out, John. It's still illegal. He can endorse them and advertise market promotions for them, but he still cannot bet. On right, I, I was going to say that. Like, I, you kind of cut me off. I was going to say. I, I still see the argument for not betting in games that you're involved with, that you have a direct hand in influencing, but an endorsement deal has nothing to do with that, right? Th in right. theory, um, it, it, like taking somebody's money to say, I like DraftKings or I like uh, FanDuel or I like Caesars Sports, whatever, that is, I think, should be okay. There shouldn't be any deal. Now, especially if he discloses it, that there shouldn't be a problem. Now, for example, we saw this was a problem when um, Ian Rappaport, uh, a fellow journalist, right, uh, made a, a deal that the NFL had a side deal with the company. Uh, right, 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 right. And they actually suspended him from their media properties because he works for NFL media. They suspended him from his media properties for like two, three weeks. His Twitter went silent. And I think it was about that company that the Manscape or something like that, the one that Gronkowski was using. Now, apparently there was like some sort of deal that none of us knew about that only certain players would be allowed to, you know. So whatever the case was, he got suspended for taking advertising money. And again, he's not a player. He didn't gamble, blah, 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 blah. This was just a violation. So we are not always privy to what the contracts say you can and cannot endorse. Right, right, right. I think I, I think what's happening now, Big John, is the companies are trying to be on the download. They're trying to have their cake and eat it too. Yeah. But eventually, the players' associations and this is uh, I loathe the players' associations like I do most unions because it's not about a winning partnership anymore. It's about screwing the fan over because the more money put into them and the game itself means higher tickets. You know, yes. which is another reason I think baseball is slowly going to wither away. But that said, I think you're right. You had those side deals and all, but. All this crap will come out through collective bargaining because they do represent all the players. Eventually, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and the big players don't want to be ostracized. It's kind of like, remember that show Playmakers on ESPN decades mm -hmm. ago? One of the best sports shows I've ever seen. Uh, when the running back was getting all the limelight, hogging all the credit, then he crossed the line of pretty much going the, well, yeah, it's me. And then the following game, the offensive line was kind of like a little lackluster with the blocking, you know? And that's how it would be in those terms. Obviously, maybe not the best analogy, but the point being is, 
they are uh, a unit amongst themselves of players. So I think all this will become legal. I don't think the betting part will eventually be, be, become legal. But when they asked Pete Rose about black men and gambling today, uh, Rose gave a quote to Sportico. I don't know if Sportico is a website only or if it's an actual media company. There's nothing illegal in that, is there? It's just the perception, like when I was caught. I just came along at the wrong time. I made, made a mistake and I paid for it. I bet on my own team to win. If I was around today, nobody would think anything of it. This goes to Manfred Mann. And this is what validates Manfred Mann. He has no clue at what he did, regardless of what era. And the reason I say that is, if I was around today, nobody would think anything of it. Yes, they would, Pete. Yeah. You bet on freaking games this guy's being game. endorsed you see and that just shows a complete disconnect from rose and what he did to uh how it relates today not yeah. a complete not 100 disconnect but enough for me to go pete you still don't get it i i agree with you it was he's just totally self-unaware completely yeah. okay self now 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 uh, man big john we've really eaten up the clock with some great storytelling and topics so let's close this one out because i still want to get the tnt where, and i'll let you take over but yeah. Looking at everything today and what's happened to Pete Rose, what's still happening to Pete Rose, and what's happening now with gambling and the opening of the doors and the floodgates, uh, with the one caveat, technically it's still illegal for players to, to gamble. But with that said, is Pete Rose going to become or is he becoming the face of Major League Baseball and professional sports hypocrisy? The poster child for you guys are hypocrites. Look no. at this guy. No. You, and why is that? Because you can't. Sometimes you have to view things in the in according to their contemporary environment, meaning the big picture. Well, it's not just the big picture, it's it's the P Rose broke the rules. He knew he was breaking the rules when the rules were in place. The fact that 40 years, roughly, because it's been almost 40 years, right? Uh that almost 30, 40 years after the fact that he broke the rules, now we're thinking of changing the rules. It doesn't change the fact that he had no idea things were going to change, right? He, he didn't know any of that. He knowingly and willingly and very calculatedly broke the rules. So I don't see him ever becoming the face of baseball. If he's lucky, if he's lucky. No, 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 no. I, I was about, he's the face of hip, the hypocrisy of well, baseball again. No, I don't view it that way either. No, I don't think I, baseball. Yeah, I, I, I think you're wrong, Big John. I, I mean, I agree with you because yeah. you've done what we've talked about before. You're looking at history in the context of history. Yeah. Not looking at history and judging them by our standards today. Uh, but he will become the face of that hypocrisy as gambling opens up more and more. And I fully believe to avoid that, he will be reinstated before we die. He well, may not be alive, but before I our was gonna, See, again, oh, if you let me talk two seconds longer. Uh, I was going to say, they might give in after he dies. They're not going to give him the satisfaction. So after Pete Rose dies, they may posthumously say he's in the Hall of Fame. Oh, then, oh no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that because of where we're headed with gambling. Dude, gambling's, we're getting ready to vote on sports book deal here in California in this, this election. So I don't think it has anything to do with how Pete Rose is perceived as much as we're going to swing so far towards the open gambling and all that, that it just let him in. That, that, that's all. Uh, but you're right. I agree with you. And you're right. Okay, the final question. Uh, and you kind of already answered it. In terms, where do you stand with Big uh, Big John? Where do you stand with Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame in or out? I think you answered that already. You should be in. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that uh, uh, certain things are so egregious that 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 like murder and things like that, and maybe the gambling falls on that line. So I won't argue it. But I'm with you. Just because of is it exceptionalism? No proof of uh, uh, his play shows like Sheila's Joe Jackson shows. Yeah. You know? uh, all right. Big John, the floor is yours. Talk to us about TNT, the Tom and Jerry. Is it the Tom and Jerry show? What is it? What's that all about? Talk all right, so it. TNT, I'll take credit for the name, not for the content. Um, as you know, we on a prior podcast, we interviewed Tim McCullough, who was an, uh, he was an OG Sports Grumblings editor-in-chief. He was one of the first guys I hired, always one of my favorites to work with. Great, great guy. And after his appearance on our show, he kind of got hooked. Uh, he had two appearances so far. He kind of got hooked. And we kind of started talking about seeing if we could get him to come on to do a show. Uh, hey John, though, real quick, what is Tim, uh, his, what validates him as, as one of the best in the industry? Oh, he's one of the great baseball pro prognosticators. Uh, he was voted the most accurate uh, 
fantasy baseball uh, not voted he won it outright i'm sorry not voted he 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 actually you're correct he actually won it for a three-year period he was the most accurate baseball prognosticator as uh voted on by um fantasy uh the the website uh fantasy pros fantasy pros yes fantasypros.com so so his his chops are there he's also an fswa award-winning writer um, he was nominated a couple of times when he still wrote for sports grumblings on the first pass round. So he's a talented guy, good guy too. And, um, so he agreed, uh, we're getting him set up. So we're going to give him about a month to get set up, uh, to get all the details worked out, to sign the contracts, whatever needs to get done. And he decided to do a show centered mainly around baseball. Uh, but it'll also include pop culture, much like this show, pop culture and a little bit of politics and whatnot. Uh, and he has, as his partner, uh, his friend, Tom, um, who uh, is going to be joining him. So, th- so they were trying to think of a name for the show. And half asleep, as you know, William, I'm up till three, four in the morning every night working. Uh, he sent me a text and he said, what should we call the show? And I said, well, why don't we call it TNT, the Tim and Tom show? And he loved it. He thought that was the greatest thing ever. He started, you know, goes, you got to hook me up with that. The TNT show, me and, me and Tom will do it, you know, so... Um, and the caveat with Tom is that politically he leans which way? He leans away from you is what he leans, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, he's, 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 a, he's what I would call a liberal, not a leftist. Of course, yeah. we don't know him that well yet, so we'll find out. Right. He, he already told us, he go, because uh, ladies and gentlemen, William does his research, as you've heard him say a lot. So he looked into Tom and he wanted to know if he was willing to fit into our culture uh, uh, our, our culture in terms of of where we all stand now you have to understand we're inclusive we're like we'll argue with anybody that's exactly a, just that's because okay. you're a liberal if you treat yeah. us with respect uh, uh uh we'll treat you with respect you, you, you get ugly there's the door and 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 tom apparently it, he's he's a good guy as well he's also knowledgeable also a baseball guy tim vouches for him which me being Tim's former boss and Tim's former uh, 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 editor, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, his word is good enough for me. Uh, William signed off on it as well. So coming soon, uh, that's where I'll leave it right now. Coming soon, TNT, the Tim and Tom show right here on Sports Grumblings. Uh, well, they'll be talking baseball at least at least once a week. Uh, and we'll we'll see where we go from there. But everyone, keep an eye out for TNT, the Tim and, the, and Tom show. It's going to be explosive, William. And for the fantasy people, these are two analytic guys, and, and I did have some uh, spoke with them. And uh, my take to them was: Look, what makes sports fun is when you can talk about it in detail. That the fantasy player leaves that show going, "Damn, I didn't know that." Because at the end of the day, for myself. We became so adept on the NFL side. We were seen as NFL insiders by some people and right. NFL analysts, but it all started with the digging of the data with uh, fantasy. So he's going to be some good stuff. We're going to keep him tied down a little bit to baseball early on, uh, get the feel out, but TNT is coming its way. And with that, Big John, another show, another heavy show. Uh, w- Big John and I are still fairly new at this, uh, but we are learning. And we urge you to visit sportsgrumblings.com. Please support our show, share our podcast. You have been listening to Points on the Board. And we, I keep saying that, but there's going to be more articles coming up. And with that, John, until next time, tell America good night. Good night, America. <laughs>